Um, Goetheanism goes back to the German poet and scientist Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who lived in between the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. And he developed a way of doing science that was a bit different from the science of his time, but also the science of our times today, which was the attempt to see, is it possible to engage with the phenomena of nature in such a way that we don't need to first look at things very conceptually with models or hypotheses, that already frame how we're going to look at nature, whether we can um, step back from the models, hold back our thinking and our abstract abstractions so that we can participate with the phenomena in a way that they can show something of their nature. So it's, it's about very careful observation and careful thinking so that you're aware of your perspective that you're taking now to, for example, to look at this particular plant um, and that you realize that the plant can be different under different conditions, for example, and then you look at it from different perspectives under different conditions and by changing your perspective, then in you, a picture of more the wholeness of the organism can arise. So that's an example of, for example, out of biology, so that you can say something about its dynamic nature rather than trying to explain it through, for example, mechanisms, um, molecular me mechanisms, which is what we tend to do today very strongly. Yeah. And we often have the feeling when we find a mechanistic explanation, then we understood the thing. Yeah, and, and we, especially also in this course, um, we try to bring attention, if, if you now take, take the organism, so let's say last year the plant, pay attention to the plant's growth, for instance, plant development, expression in all its forms, and then comparative. Yeah, different plants are being compared with each other. And then something very different, also different relationship of the observer to the observed uh, arises. And one reason for that is that you are engaged much more thoroughly in your own participation. It's, you can say, not, yeah, it's, it, it, it requires much more of you to enter into, let's say, a particular uh, growth form of particular trees. Yeah, when you take that serious, and we often find, I mean, it's, it's um, I think, felt by every participant, that this is uh, supported when you do artistic exercises. So you, you pay attention to form, as a sculptor would do. And now not to be an artist, of course, but uh, the sculpting, um, that you can say a plant sculpts itself, yeah, grows, grows itself, grows its own substance and its own form, yeah. And maybe just one aspect in there is that in science we often learn, you know, the science is to be objective. And the way that has developed is to pull back more and more from direct experience and to put instrumentation in between to be objective. And this approach doesn't have anything against um, um, apparatus. You can use a microscope, you can use a telescope, but it, it's more about participating fully with um, your refined capacities so that your the objectivity is, be, is more like being becoming um, uh, uh, getting close to the, to object, the object rather right? than getting far away from it. Right, right? Yeah. rather than closing off with, you, with your experiencing it. Yeah. And when, when you go that pathway, then your own, you can say perceptivity, if that's the right word. So, so your own 
what you are able to pick up in your world, what you're able to see, let's say, yeah, to pay attention to, it grows. And then you can say the world becomes much more vibrant, colorful, interesting, and, and this, this is, a, you could ha say, has a healing quality for modern, modern men, modern people. Because I'm speaking about us modern people, right? Um, who are so removed from phenomena, not only from nature, but from in general phenomena. We, we have the potential to be so removed. We are closed in, in our homes, air conditioned, weather doesn't make big difference, uh, seasons don't make a big difference. We can be, with our book learning and our now computer skills, we can be really in our own world. Yeah, yeah and then picture what, what that could potentially mean. Yeah, and we see it in the participants here in Sagres now, the fourth year, that the, the result of all these studies, and they are, Sometimes very subtle and and wie nennt man das anspruchsvoll um, demanding. demanding practices. Yeah, it's not just easy, um, but the result is often a joyfulness. Yeah, a joyfulness. So I, yeah, something happens in them that opens doors, as they say. Yeah, which is beautiful when that happens to adults. Yeah, who are not that young anymore, <laughs> so for instance, yeah? I would say abstraction has its way if it is overpowering us, and this is our only way of relating, and then ask yourself, what do you mean with abstractions, yeah? Um, then you can say it is against experiencing the world, so also against everything that comes as nurturing, yeah, that there is this nurturing needed. People show you the way they go often in vacations to beautiful places, the ocean, the lake, the mountains. What they are seeking are experiences. So now you can say, so why would I be so um, eager to, to have this not in my daily life? But you can make it a practice, and all the skills that you can say, all the advantages mm -hmm. of abstract thinking need to be balanced. Yeah, yeah you, you can say abstractness can mean that you are not tending to the concrete anymore, the concrete around you. So not your garden, your plants, maybe even your children. Yeah. And, the, and another aspect of that is if you look at how often people learn science, it's through textbooks and um, and then the teachers teach according to the textbook. And the textbooks are not phenomena, they're thoughts and abstractions of human beings. Right? Yeah. So that instead of engaging first with plants and animals and color phenomena or the phenomena of mechanics or their they're getting the ideas first and maybe a little experience afterwards. And in this approach, you really want to have the experience come first and then the ideas to grow out of them so that the thoughts are not so far removed and therefore not so abstract, have taken out of the world, right? Yeah, yeah you, can, you can have uh, examples where you know something and have never met it. Yeah, so, so let's say in physics, you can learn some laws of this or that, but you have never dealt with it, you have never met it. Um, we, we had some examples in this course. So, and then there's a big difference, whether it is a learning, if you're honest, you can say, well, I know what other people tell me about it. It's never your own knowing. So this, you become a knower, this is something under-emphasized in our culture. And I think this makes a big difference and is also a big danger. When you are not a knower, then you are dependent on what other people tell you about the world and what to do. Yeah, so, so encouraging 
the young already people in, in school, yeah, not only college, but from early on to, to engage and become knowing, yeah, it's also skilled. Yeah, all this direction in education and, and every, every sh step of education, I think is almost now, we are so far that we have no choice. One expression of this, that I am not a knower, I really don't know the basics, is the um, uprising distrust in science. Yeah, people who are not connected with um, this type of knowing, they only hear it as authorities. And these authorities, as we know, contradict each other. So why should I say he or she is right? So, so your own your own ability to judge, but that needs to have a basis, yeah. Yeah, experience. Yeah, you are in contact with the world, and then also refined experience, so thinking about things. I, I would kind of reframe the question and say, what are some of the tasks of the human being in order to be responsible members of the planet? Right? Okay. Yeah. So I think that, um, because that's an important question that we all have in a way. Right? And on, on the one hand, one can see today with all the, the political unrest everywhere seems to be. Right? And this question of, of truthfulness, is, is there any such thing as truth anymore? when people can just lie all the time and not worry about it. So this question of where does a sense of truthfulness come from? And I think, I mean, in a way, Henrika was just speaking to that, that if you know how you have come to a certain knowledge of something, because you did it, you studied this plant, you know how a scientist comes to knowledge. You've learned about the process, not just the result, but how scientific knowledge comes about. Then you are more a, a more discerning human being. And you that I think that creates in you an inner compass to guide you and to say this is really off the um, off of center and should be disregarded and here we can say i'm dealing with something that has to do with truthfulness and i think that's something in very fundamental right so withholding judgment in a way when i now say after 15 years of working with um, light and color phenomena and many 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 phenomena i would not say i withhold judgment yeah Maybe I wouldn't say my judgment in a course because my um, yeah my goal is that uh, people on their own become interested, discover things, and discover relationships. So in the physics, it would be always be um, dis discovering what under what circumstances um, certain phenomena arise, which of those conditions are necessary, but then also. How do these phenomena speak about something higher? Yeah. So, so we are we are in, in that direction right now too here. So, um, no. but it's coming to judgments through experience, yeah. and yeah. not having judgments preformed all the time yeah. that we just apply to any circumstances. So, so that is the big difference, of, right? Uh, trying to make shortcuts to prove your judgment before actually the manifest you have given the manifestation right. sufficient right. So you way could, to show itself. You could yeah. almost describe it like this, yeah? When you when when you agree that yeah, in a tree, for instance, yeah, there is this way of growing. So I call this now the lawfulness of the tree, if if that's okay. Yeah, or um, yeah you want to enter into the wisdom at work in the world. You do not want to, uh, we, 
try, yeah, of course we have also all the ideas about the world, yeah, maybe this, this is how the language reveals it. It is not you want to know about, you want to get uh, to know what is at work. And that is a much harder task. Yeah. So that the, we are, one way of saying it is that the phenomena begin to speak. Yeah. yeah? And then, I mean, I, if you look, look at that then from the side of human interactions, then it's clear that listening comes first, trying to see something from another perspective than the one you have. And we're exercising that all the time, not so much directly with human interactions, um, but with looking at different phenomena, but then seeing how this person sees this aspect, mm -hmm. this person sees this aspect, this person sees, and they complement each other. And that is an exercising that overcomes this terrible situation we have today of polar mm -hmm. <coughs> polarization, where the w one group of people cannot even listen to the other group of people. And, and it's very difficult. I mean, I'm, I can say that I have very difficult time listening to certain people. Right? And you notice that that's really hard. How but do we is, engage in yeah. conversations, in dialogue, that al allow those pre prejudices to fall away? But then it's clear it has to come from all sides, <laughs> otherwise it doesn't happen. Yeah, but there, there are already these um, situations where it is not really a conversation anymore. It is actually a battle. Yeah, yeah, so so we are not now looking in that direction. But what we, what we see in all these courses, when they um, work well, there is, um, so you could say, the biographical richness that is present in a group. Yeah? Because the people in our courses often have very different professional backgrounds. And now you sit in a room and you turn to, uh, your attention to one thing that you all turn your attention to. And so this person can bring this in relation to something that really matters in life. This person, so the, you could say what becomes in this shared work, yeah, in, in a higher sense, opens up, we, yeah, and then communication is very fruitful. And something like peace-giving quality is in this type of work. Yeah. It's almost understandable, right? If I am not trying to, to prove my idea and my theories, but I say, oh, what is the theory at work in whatever we are now studying, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uncovering that, uh, together yeah and another aspect is is just by engaging you know with concrete plants and animals mm -hmm. and color and light and air and water you gain a wholly different respect for the planet yeah and we need in our time of climate change where we're disturbing so much to have more of a sense of in her words, the wisdom at work everywhere in the world and understand that more deeply so that our actions can become increasingly um, in harmony and furthering of the planet rather than just furthering our egotistical goals. Yeah, right? you, can, you can say um, this, um, this way of coming to respect yeah, this, this is an ethical dimension. It brings you to dealing with, let's say, a landscape in a different way when you came to that point. And ethical, and this is the beauty of it, is now not added on, you shall do this, but it comes out of a very natural engagement. Yeah, you see the value, you learn the value. Yeah, you, you, you also see what can be lost. And, Many things have been lost, and in many other places, lots of effort are done to to bring back what's almost being lost. Yeah, yeah. so so there's a lot of restoration effort, or yeah, yeah. I would say 
first of all, now would be, there are so many forms of meditation, right? So certainly there are some forms of meditation with which Goethe's work would have nothing to do, probably, right? I, but that's not the point. So when we say meditation, we, we definitely mean a very a turned inward activity, yeah, or so I leave out um, some meditation forms, but an inward, and I would definitely say an inward component in this work is is maybe even evolving by itself. I mean, when when I when I look back to how certain things have um, grown now in Craig's work or in my work or in other people's work, there is. Um, a component where you can say you stay with it yeah. you stay with it it's not I finally understood it and but why would you not stay with something that has become important yeah. that has opened up that's a real presence in the world right in as much as I would call it more contemplative is a word I would be fine to use your you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it because it's necessary in order that, that the things can show more to you, right? Yeah. So you have to quiet. You have to, mm -hmm. um, so I would say now, the in, it's not turned inward. This is not the turned inward aspect. It's actually being with something, mm -hmm. right? And, and being with it in a quiet way and, and, and moving with it, right? And then, but so that's kind of the more contemplative turned towards towards the experience directly. And then a practice that we have is that, for example, if we've observed a certain plant one day, we will ask people in the course then to quietly repicture the plant as vividly as possible. Not think about it, not speculate about it, but how were the leaves arranged on the stem? What color was it? How did it smell? What was the texture like? What was the, the flower arrangement? And really in your imagination to recreate the experience. And that forms a much more deep connection to the, to the world. It, or it deepens your connection to the things that then they actually appear differently. If you do this enough, your meeting with the plant is more rich. And that's clearly a contemplative practice. But again, it's, well, I, I'll use an expression that's a Goethean uh, philosopher used. He said, the Goethean approach is a, is, uh, involves the metamorphosis of the scientist, right? So a, a transformation. Yeah. If you don't change yourself, unless you're very gifted, Right, which we're not. Oh, you have in, changed already. <laughs> yeah, that, that the world, you need to change yourself or the, you need to let the world change you so that the world can show you more of itself, right? Yeah. I mean, and I think that's the aspect of this exercising different perspectives that once you see the dispute coming about, um, between two people is that okay can we understand how you're seeing this and can i understand how you're seeing this and sometimes for example right now we're working with color um phenomena yeah. people see colors differently color perceptions are, are very different and they're you very different this, right? and you cannot expect to see exactly even from the same angle with the same illumination you might not see it the way the other person sees it, and Absolutely. you just have to accept that. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but what I was relating you to relating was a to little something bit different. Yeah. yeah. When now let's say colleagueship, we work together. It can really be because you. It's not that you understand it or you have already the right idea. You are forming it. You're developing it, and. Um, the communication there needs to be very honest. Yeah, so we would say uh, we um, can build on now 21 years of colleagueship. Yeah, where the attitude was when I see something that I think is not thought well, or it's, it's, it's a wrong concept, let's say, fast, yeah, then I will say that. 
and and not in in the um, intention to destroy some work, but to better some work. And whether it's really a better idea will show itself. Yeah. And that's that's a very fruitful, honest. Yeah, whereas we are working together, and in 21 years we did move. Yeah. So those of us, it's know, not just the two of us, but other colleagues. The so colleagueship at the Nietzsche Institute. So right? we can argue with each other. Yeah. Quite vehemently, and still be friends. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and of course, we don't do that so much in our courses. Yeah. No. Right. That's a different yeah. situation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I think Gertianism lies at the basis of all real Waldorf education. So what I mean by that is that a, an educator has a big task, on the one hand, to work out of a knowledge of the developing child, right? so to try as best they can to perceive the 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 children and the individual differences of the children and their needs, which is already a very big task. So that means you need to be perceptive. You can't just be children are like this and I am going to teach them this. Or right? even worse, no matter how children are, I'm going to teach this. That's the curriculum. Yeah. We know the style also, right? Yeah. And so then then you have the subject matter itself and this are you teaching out of something that you know that you've experienced or that you can bring vividly to the students so that they can relate to it as full human beings and so this um, and the question is then how do i bring something to my students not just what i'm bringing but how do i bring it so that you're attending to the whole process. And of course, the Gertian approach is about this conscious attending to things, being aware of how you're doing it, so that you, you know what kind of a relation you're in or entering. So for me, that's also very important so that Waldorf education does not become dogmatic or does not become tradition which the two are often connected. I do this because I was told in the fourth grade you teach this. And of course you can begin like that as a teacher. You have to begin somewhere and say, somebody told me this, okay, I'm going to do it and see what happens. Yeah. And that's a beginner's right to do this. Yeah. But over time, it become, needs to become more insight. And also at this moment, the children need this, and I planned this, people told me to do this, but this is what's needed, and I'm going to do it. And there's right. all, one side also, and this is what I'm good at, and this is what I'm interested in. So that warms part of the, of the teacher. Yeah. There are some subjects maybe that the teacher is not so interested in. Yeah, but it's a gift, really, what you bring to the children when you are interested in something and look with them. Yeah. D Daniel said, in, when we visited him uh, last week, he said, the, the colleges are, are old. In universities. The, the un yeah, universities, because they teach from the past what's already known. What we really need is to develop our future. We, we need to develop those capacities that are able to bring about, and now I'm saying it freely, a future that's different from some of the uh, present time developments. Yeah, that we can bring an alternative. Alternative to what? Yeah, you could say a world about in which we want to live. I mean, I think the whole issue of technology today, right, which is a very different situation when I started teaching a long time ago, um, where there were no cell phones, there were no computers that children had, there was television, right? Um, and so this, the screen age, if you want to put it that, and the computer games and all of this, you have, then you're not connecting 
with the world, right, directly, right? So all the experience is highly mediated and by, by people who have created the technologies in such a way that they want you to come back to this again and again and again. So a tendency towards wanting to make you addicted to this, yeah? So yeah. The, it seems like, the, you know, if you look at Waldorf education or education altogether, to counterbalance that, because we're not going to get rid of it, to counterbalance that, you need more and more experience, right? So that, you know, I don't know if it's in Brazil, but in the United States, there are many forest kindergartens now mm -hmm. where the children are outside doing things most of the morning. Mm -hmm. And there, that is such a good counterbalance and gives them a strength that balances this other that I see is important. And I feel that other education, the, the older they get, it needs to incorporate more and more direct experience so that if I were teaching now in the high school like I used to teach, I would do a lot differently. I would make sure that my students are having more outside classroom experiences of engaging in the real world without their phones, without their computers, and not to say they shouldn't have those, but it just needs this other balance so that they can discern what this world is and what it's not. Otherwise, they only know the one and they forget that this world exists. Yeah. Yeah. There are, in Rudolf Steiner's work, in Rudolf Steiner's lectures, there are places where he would say, all my work is phenomenology. This is a word he didn't use, right? But the connection to Goetheanism is there. You, as if you could say, it's always based on experience always based on experience but then so inner development going further than other people can go the fact that um, the Goetheanum in Donor is called Goetheanum points to to that right so whether he for his own um, spiritual research needed Goethean science I do not know but for the way he communicated it as a modern path of initiation, I think for that Goetheanism is needed because this is our path of seeing more than we see with abstract eyes, abstracting eyes, yeah. or the theorizing eyes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was clearly biographically very important in his life, right? Because he spent seven years. Um, editing Goethe's scientific writings. Yeah, and not that, because he wanted to do it, but he was asked to do it, and he took on the task, yeah? And I must say, so being German myself, if it wasn't for Rudolf Steiner, um, that Goethe was a scientist, would be, even in the German culture, pretty much not, not, not known. Yeah, so you can say all that happened since then um, and in the 20th century in Goethean scientific research in many, many areas, so let's say uh, chemistry or medicine or wherever, um, you can say has to do with the fact that what was being lost after Goethe died and then into the 19th century being lost and materialism in its um, crassness really surfacing and dominating yeah you could say had a chance of being known again through Rudolf Steiner yeah. yeah yeah because most of the people who worked with the Goethean method practically not just theoretically but practically have come through Steiner to Goethe like we have right yeah not yeah. not through under pathways yeah. other pathways so that's yeah. that's historically very important yeah yeah yeah, yeah.